Okay. Okay. Any more questions? Uh, I have a question. Um, yeah. It's um, kind of tangentially from the midterm, but not exactly related. I was wondering if uh, R, the set of real numbers uh, under addition, is isomorphic to C, uh, the set of complex numbers under addition? Uh, no, because uh, uh, they, are, they have different dimensions as manifolds, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, you have a point because, you know, we know from the way that Cantor, uh, you know, classified infinities that, uh, you know, two different, so for example, you know, the positive integers Z plus and the integers Z, you know, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence, right? So, uh, but, yeah. But as groups, you know, R1 uh, is an additive group, and C2 is all C1 is also an additive group, right? <clears throat> C1 is also an additive group. <clears throat> and uh, but no, they are they are different dimensions. Okay. So C1, you can you can, you know, it's uh it has you know, you can, C1 is uh, R2, right? Yeah. With, with, some, uh, with some extra structure put on it. Yeah. Right. So my intu this is what my intuition said, that because they have different number of real parameters, they couldn't be yeah. isomorphic. But I couldn't, because they're both uncountable, I, I, I was just forced to say they're not isomorphic because I couldn't come up with an explanation for why there wouldn't be a bijection between them. Right. I mean, you know, it's a, you, you can have two elements, right? You can have alpha and beta. But here you have only one, one parameter, right? So here you can have alpha plus alpha one and beta plus beta one and uh, so this is a group operation in R cross R or C1. Whereas here it's gamma plus gamma one, right? So obviously uh, if, you, if you take here uh, gamma to be uh, say, uh, so it's alpha and alpha one, you can only create an isomorphism between this and this part. You cannot create an isomorphism simultaneously with the both parts, right? Yeah. I later on I looked it up because I was curious and there were some posts on uh, math stack exchange where they were saying that you can make them isomorphic to each other, but it involved some math that I wasn't uh, like is beyond me so I was like okay well I think it's fine if I just say they're not isomorphic to each other. Yeah yeah what, what kind of. Uh... What did this talk about? What technique? they said that they're isomorphic to each other as vector spaces over the rational numbers, which I don't know what that means. I know what a vector space is, but I don't know what it means to be over the rational numbers. Um, and right. Then, and then they said, since that's true, they must also be isomorphic as groups. And I also have no idea why that link what what links those two things. So I was like, okay, this I is see, I see. I'm yeah, this is beyond our pay, pay grade. Yeah, you're right. But that's why, so I mean, you know, rational numbers are numbers of this form, right? And all the rational numbers apparently form a field. So, you know, okay. when, you, when you have a vector space, a vector space o over a field, right? Uh, if we, when we say V is a vector space, is a vector space, over uh, some field, say F, uh, what we mean is that if alpha and beta are elements of that vector space, and say A and B are elements of that F, then we are only allowed to take um, linear combinations of this form. Okay, so you cannot take say, so if this F is say the real numbers, you, you, you cannot take A to be a complex number. Okay, so 
So what I, what they're saying is that uh, it, this field could be just a rational number. So this is this field could be just if this field is just a rational number, then uh, then uh, the two are isomorphic, right? That's what they're saying. Oh, I see. Okay, but that, that's what it means for 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 a uh, vector. When we, the important thing I want you to know, take away from here is that V is a vector space. If you come across the statement V is a vector space over some field F, yeah, this is what it means. Oh, I was thinking that this meant that alpha and beta would have to be rational numbers. And I was thinking, well, we're making, that doesn't make sense. The real numbers obviously have more numbers than just the rational numbers. Uh, right. But yeah, the thing is that a vector, a vector, you know, we are thinking of think we are used to thinking of vector in terms of matrices, right? So you you say, oh, maybe this is a vector, or you know, when I say a vector, you you probably think of oh, I, I'm thinking of a uh, when I'm thinking when I tell you of an n-dimensional vector space, you are thinking, okay, then we have something like this. I was thinking of an arrow or a graph, two D graph as vector. Right, well, a, a column, you know, in a, a direction in n-dimensional space or, or a column vector, right? So that's just a very, this is not a vector per se, this is a representation of a vector, okay? I mean, it is a vector, but it's a, it's a vector in a particular basis. A vector is a more general object. A vector is a part of a set that satisfies certain axioms, the axioms of vector space. Okay, and when we introduce in that vector space, you know, uh, some ortho orthonormal basis, so which means some set of basis vectors, and then, which means that any vector in that vector space can be expressed as linear combination of these things. That's what it means. It does, it, it just, that's what the basis is. So when we say V is, you know, V1, E1 plus V2, E2 plus dot, 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 Vn, En. Now these coefficients, they have to be chosen from the field. They cannot be chosen arbitrarily. So if you're considering a vector space over the reals, then these Vs have to be real numbers. Okay, we cannot, if you're considering the vector, the field to be a complex numbers, they can, then they can be complex numbers. And I guess if you're thinking that they have to be rational, then they have to be rational numbers. And oh, uh, I see, I get it now. Right. So, so you, now the rest of it is you have to figure out what basis you can like. Right. Express so in this basis, you know, this guy has a representation. And that representation is V1, V2, dot, 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 Vn. But in general, you know, this vector, and that's why, you know, when we, you know this from three-dimensional vector calculus, or even just, you know, a vector algebra, that when you change your basis, when you rotate your basis, your, the, the, the component of the vector changes, right? And that's why the, uh, you know, the, statement that first year undergraduates will often make that oh, it's a positive vector is a nonsensical statement because you know whether a vector is positive a component of a vector is positive or, or negative depends on the basis you have chosen so for example if i'm if i have this is my you know a reference frame and i have a vector like this it has only one component and that component is a positive number but the vector remains uh, like this, but suppose that this is my new reference frame, then the vector has, you know, its uh, y component is negative, its x component remains positive. In, in both of these cases, you know, the vector remains unchanged, but its components are changing. And here, what we, we can be, what we are seeing here is that this is a representation of a vector with reference to a particular, uh, you know, basis, right? But a vector itself is not the column. It's a, you know, it is a, it is a, uh, an element of an abstract set 
which satisfies the axioms of vector space. Now from those, those axioms and uh, some other notion of inner product, although inner product is unnecessary, you can derive the notion of a basis. And then from there, uh, you know, linear independence, if you introduce that notion of a linear independence, then you have the notion of a basis. And from there, you can derive all these things, okay? Yeah, got you, got it. So the, these are ideas that were supposed to be taught in your linear algebra course. Oh yeah, they were. Uh, I just didn't know what these specific things meant. I, right, right. I, so I basically, you know, that, yeah. that's, that's very good that you bring it up. That means that, you know, we are connecting the dots between different courses, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, uh, before we move on, any more questions? Sir, would you check the chat, please? Okay, so yeah, we want to come back to what is a Lie algebra, right? So we got distracted. So um, I think you know the time of uh, break should should it still be at six or do we have to push it back a little bit? So fifty push it back from to six fifteen p.m. Oh, okay, six fifteen then. Okay, we have then about fifteen minutes. Okay, all right. So uh, so we have been discussing you know we for lee groups we said that you know uh it, it, an element of lee group that is continuously connected to the identity can be represented in this form okay and uh and we said that these xis these are called generators and by the closure property, so we know that if I multiply two such elements, you know, I should get another element like this. And then what we did is that we did a second order expansion of this. Why second order? Because we know that for abelian for uh, for non abelian lie groups you know if i take the left hand side if i take the left hand side then this multiplication in general this is not going to be equal to i of alpha i plus beta i xi, right? In general, for Lie groups, this is not true. So, uh, so the interesting stuff, the non commutative stuff comes up second order in the, uh, in the parameter. And we basically want to know what is the most fundamental thing that we can do uh, to derive the condition. And we took the log of those sides and we did an expansion. And we found that for this to be true, the commutator of two of the generators should give me a linear combination of the generators themselves. And these coefficients of linear combination, which for real compact Lie groups can be chosen to be real, uh, this is something we will show later. For now, they're just numbers. They're called structure constants. So F, I, J, K are known as structure constants. Okay. And we will show, this is on our syllabus, that, you know, for compact Lie groups, the structure constants, let me just use, Fij, 
f i j k, you know, can be chosen to be completely anti-symmetric. Okay, so for example, um, uh, so here from the definition, we see that the, this first two indices, it has to be anti-symmetric, right? The left-hand side is anti-symmetric, so the right-hand side must be anti-symmetric in I and J. But there is no reason why K and J, those should be anti-symmetric. And, but if one can show that, and this will, will show it that for compact Lie groups, we can write these F, I, J, Ks. So for compact Lie groups, these can be written as F, I, J, K, and that they are completely antisymmetric. Meaning that if you symmetrize all the indices, they will be zero. So okay. to clarify, so to clarify mm -hmm. the uh, continuously deformed to identity part, if I change the parameters of the matrix, uh, if I think the matrix is on a surface, then they can continuously be deformed into the one, 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 one identity matrix. Is that the case? Yeah, 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 and, exactly. Yeah, when, when and, alpha is zero, yeah, yeah. Yes, and we get the e to the power i alpha uh, x. So those x, right. the generators make the Lie algebra and the e to the power i alpha x make a group. Is that exactly, yeah. So the algebra it, is for that. So that the generators are from an algebra and they are generating a set of matrices that make the Lie group. Correct. Oh, okay, got it. Yes, okay, very good.